Good morning, Jillian. Good morning. Please respond in some way, chat, voice, whatever, so that I know you're you're here. Good morning. Excellent. Glad you glad you're with us. So uh Right now, it's just you and me. Um, that's fine. Uh, generally, when that happens, uh, we sort of plow through the stuff that's uh, planned, and then we knock off early. So we'll do that. If folks roll in a little bit late, we'll rope them into the conversation, and then we'll carry on. Um, so. Let me start by asking you, um, can you just check in with me and tell me what you feel like you learned last week? And um, tell me if there's anything that you don't feel clear on. Well, I, I registered late, so I am catching up, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I've been reading. I have two talk books. So I've been reading. I've been. Which ones? Which ones do you have? I have um, Commonwealth Caribbean Thought Law by Gilbert Goldingi. Okay. And I that's, have. That's the important one. That's the required one. I have Elliot and Quinn. Okay. Oh. So that so that's the other book that I use to supplement my own prep. Um, there's a couple of other books that are available at the bookshop or that are listed on the course outline um, that I'm sure are are great. I have not purchased them. I have not reviewed them. They were uh, placed on the course outline by a predecessor of mine. Um, so I can't I can't recommend them or or suggest that you avoid them because I don't know anything about them. But uh, the Cotellini is required because it's focused on Caribbean law as opposed to English law. And the Elliot and Quinn is a, a, a helpful supplement um, that I think is, if I remember correctly, I actually think I chose the Elliot and Quinn because it was the cheapest of the <laughs> English books at the bookshop. Um, and so just in terms of bang for the buck, uh, that's why I think I, I recommend it over the others. Um, so how do you feel in terms of what you've what you've covered and catching up now the the lectures are recorded and they're available on on YouTube there's a link on e learning so you can you can review those at your le leisure. Okay, so so far I, I am at um, in areas and Queen I'm at negligent, which is the development of duty of care right yep. so the contrast between Donald B Stevenson and the neighborhood neighborhood. Um, principle where you have to have a duty of care, it doesn't matter if the person lives next to you once it is um, possible that it could cause your action or omission can cause harm to that person, then that person is considered your neighbor and you owe them a duty of care. However, um, I read that I read some cases where the duty of care in Anz and Morton and London where the duty of care is not always applicable. Yeah, uh, so that's, those are the lectures that we did last week. And, um, you know, with the process by which we determine whether a duty of care applies has evolved over time, right? So Donahue is like a 1932 case. Um, and certainly it's, you know, it's a very pithy statement, right? You, uh, you shall not harm your neighbor defined as reasonably reasonable foreseeability, but that's not, that's not the extent of the test anymore. 
Um, the test is a little more involved and there is room for judges to undertake uh, a policy making function in an effort to, uh, to determine whether a new duty of care should, should be imposed, right? So the way that the, the duty of care analysis works in modern times is you start by asking, has a, a duty of care been imposed in an analogous situation before, right? Is there a precedent for a duty of care in this case? And if there is not, then, then things get a little woolly, right? Things get difficult. And that's where there's some room for policy making. There's some room for, you know, asking what would be the consequences of imposing a duty of care, um, those kinds of questions. Uh, and it's at that point that the, the cases get hard. So does, does that make sense? I don't, I, I, I worry that, um, I worry that a lot of, of students in this faculty want certainty. And one of the things that I think you learn as you proceed through the study and the practice of law is that very little is actually certain. So, good morning, Kezrin. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, sir. Just I'm, woke I'm, up, so. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, you know, 8 a.m. classes uh, do that to you. I, I remember when I was an undergraduate, um, I took an 8 a.m. Uh, research methods class thinking, oh, this will be fine. I won't have any problem getting to class. And um, I think I attended uh, seven class sessions over the course of the entire semester. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you, if you feel like you can manage uh, getting up and you'll notice I'm, I'm here with, uh, with my cup of coffee. Um, if you feel like you can manage uh, joining us every week at 8 a.m., by all means, stick around in this tutorial. If, if you think you're going to have problems, uh, I think you can still switch, and I, I won't, you know, you, I will not think less of you for <laughs> being self-aware. Um, there won't be no problem, sir. All right. Um, okay. So um, with that, uh, the... You know, we, we've discussed what was covered uh, last week, and that's, that's going to be something that we're going to do every week in tutorials. We're just going to check in for a few minutes and, and see, you know, how you feel about what you learned last week and if there's anything that isn't clear and that needs, needs some fleshing out for you. Um, and then the other thing that I asked you to prepare for is the question, uh, contract and criminal liability sufficiently deter negligent conduct without the need for independent causes of action in tort? And I'll put that in the chat for you so that you can see it. And the question, and, and obviously this statement is not a question, but the question is, is it correct? Yes or no? And I asked you to prepare both sides. Um, so Jillian, you said you just enrolled and you're trying to catch up. So we will sort of give you the second bite at the apple. Kezron, um, explain to me why you, you know, what's your argument? What's the best argument you were able to come up with for why this statement is true? You're muted, man. So if you're, if you're trying to say anything, you got to come off mute.
Hello? Kesrin? Kesrin, can you say something in the chat so that I know you're you're still hearing me? Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, you're back. Welcome. Yes, sir. Okay, so with regards to criminal liability, I'm mm -hmm. going to answer them separately. Sure. With regard to criminal liability, I would say that criminal liability does sufficiently, without a need for action being brought in tort, um, essentially persuade persons not to, um, hold on, I'm going to go back. Could you send the chat in the question again? I'm sorry, what, what do you need? Chat in the question again because since I got kicked out, the chat, oh, I'm the chat, it, the chat yeah. reset. Let me let me do yes, that. For you. Okay, so there you go. Okay, yes. So I would say that criminal liability sufficiently deters negligent conduct without the need to, for independent causes being brought in tort. This is because of the penalties on the criminal liability. However, I would not say the same for contract. Because on the contract, penalties are not as stiff. And so I feel as though if a person would not be able to succeed in an action in contract, that would require them to bring an action in tort in order to seek some sort of benefit. So... As I, as I understand it, your argument basically amounts to a remedies argument that, um, that the remedies for criminal liability are sufficiently severe to deter negligence even without the additional remedies of tort. Yes, sir. And that, However, and that, and that for contract, that, that is not the case. Yes, sir. Okay. I think there's still also some exceptions on the criminal liability in which persons may still wish to see some sort of redress in another value other than the punishment for the person committing the crime. Okay. Such as in the case that if a person was say speeding and was to hit the person on the road. Okay, let me, let me throw a couple of questions at you. The first one is related to standards of proof um so what does the what does the crown have to prove in order to convict someone of a crime and i don't mean the elements of the crime i mean um like burden of proof right what is the burden of proof on the criminal liability the burden of proof would be beyond a reasonable doubt okay um and in tort uh do you know the burden of of proof it i don't think yes, we've sir. talked about it so it's it may on the balance of probability right so preponderance of the evidence is the phrase i'm more familiar with but they're the same thing right um it's it's slightly more likely it's than not and it can be just be ever so slightly right the the formulation that um i used to use with my clients was we have to prove that it's at least a 50-50 chance plus something, anything, however small. And that that's enough for the jury to find in our favor. Um, or the judge in, in the Caribbean, since uh, civil litigation isn't tried to a jury down here. Um, so do you think that the difference in proof standards should play a role in whether we evaluate uh, whether whether criminal liability is sufficient, because obviously you know beyond a reasonable doubt is a much higher standard than the balance of probabilities, and um, what winds up happening is if you eliminate tort liability, then 
all of these cases where the proof that's available falls somewhere between the balance of probabilities and beyond a reasonable doubt have, there's no remedy for them, right? Oh, we lost him. Jillian, have you been following or are you, do you have any thoughts? Yes, I'm following. Okay. What are you, what are you thinking? Um, I think if I were to answer the question or attempt to, I would have um, went in the direction that Kezron went, right? Because I wouldn't think of the extent of um, proving and the unreasonable doubt and because I didn't know of the, how you came to the thought, how, how, how we prove it in court. I didn't know mm -hmm. of that. So that was new to me, and I'm glad that he you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you know this is this is why you're here, right? As I, um, I think I said this at the beginning of the semester when you weren't in enrolled, but you know, learning is a process of failing until you don't. Right? If you're not. If you're not failing at something, if, if, if you're not getting information and going, oh, I didn't think of that, um, you're not really learning. And so this is, you know, this is a really important piece of the puzzle is um, it's okay to go, oh, that, that's new to me, because that's the point. If, if none of this is new to you, then you're not really learning. You're just sort of jumping through the hoops for the for a credential, and that's fine. We'll give you the credential, but uh, it's not really what we. It's not we. We want students who who come away from the class with more than they started with. So, um, so let me let me ask you this since you, you say that your answer would have been similar to Kezrin's related to uh, remedies. Um, you know, we've discussed the standard of proof. Um, what about the, um, the issue of, uh, of redress, right? So, um, in a tort case, um, the, the point is that some other person, some private actor, not the state, has been harmed by the tortfeasor's negligence. Kesrin, we're, we're discussing, uh, we've moved on to a, um, a different question um, related to redress. Okay, so, you know, when uh, in a criminal uh, case, the state um, brings the claim and the state is sort of the, the offended party. And the, the whole theory of criminal liability is that um, you have engaged in a wrong against the state or the crown, right? Um, in tort, the purpose of imposing liability is to make whole the injured party, not necessarily to punish the tort feature, although there are some circumstances where we do bring in a, a deterrent logic and a punishment logic um, in the remedies, on the remedy side. But if we eliminate tort liability and we say, okay, we're gonna use crime instead, what does that do to the injured parties who would normally bring a tort lawsuit? Sure, sure. So the argument 
that's been offered is that criminal liability can successfully replace tort liability. Um, and my question is what happens to all the injured people who in the current world would sue in tort and receive and be made whole, right? So they would, they would receive uh, compensation for the damage they've suffered. What happens to them when instead of bringing their tort lawsuit, the director of public prosecutions decides uh, whether to, to, bring a, uh, to bring an indictment? Well, unfortunately, those persons would have no means of address in such circumstances. Right. So, um, do we think that that means that replacing tort liability with criminal liability can uh, sort of fill the gap? Or do we think that there's going to be some sort of dead weight loss? It would certainly be a loss. Okay. All right. So does it seem to you that maybe this, this means that um, the other side of the statement might be might be the better argument that maybe we do need tort that crime can't replace tort Because of the differences between criminal liability and tortious liability, I would say that that is, um, that is a conclusion that you can come to, that we need tort. Because if we were to essentially move tortious liability, then there would be a gap that would be left. Okay. I agree with that. Uh, but let me flip sides. Okay. Because what we are doing, right, if we are saying, okay, we're going to do away with private tort liability and we're going to completely replace it with uh, prosecutions, um, then, you know, that's a fundamental reimagining of the legal system, okay? That's, that's a massive shift from the sort of incremental evolution of the common law. What that suggests to me is that there's room for some really imaginative shifts in the broader uh, system, right? Both the legal system and the, the administrative system. So what, you know, what would you do Right. What are the things that you would want to change in order to eliminate these these gaps that would that would open up? Feel free to take a minute and think on this one. I don't you know, don't uh, don't be too off the cuff with this one. Let's let's think about it for a minute.
Okay. Feel free to, to keep thinking. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but once you're, once you're ready, you're more than welcome to, to chime in. The question again, for in, in case somebody's gotten lost in their own head, which happens to me sometimes, um, the question is what policy, what policies or practices would you implement to close the gap that would be created if we replaced a private tort action with a criminal prosecution? As I'm thinking, I'm seeing that there would be a very big gap. I feel as though there would be, have to be multiple suggestions policy-wise in order to fill that gap. However, the main one that I would say, and the main one I've not been able to think about more deeply, would be with regard to compensating individuals for um, any action that would have taken place against them that would have put them in a lesser position. Mm -hmm. So what what would you what would you compensate for? For that, I think that would be a discretionary um discretion to the judge. Ah, so so basically, the state's entitled to ask for compensation to the the injured party, but what that compensation looks like is going to be uh, fact specific and case driven. Is that is yes, that what sir. you're saying? Yeah. So. Um, okay, so do you think that in a criminal prosecution that um, the judge should be able to award uh, damages for pain and suffering? Okay. Would, would the, uh, would the DPP have to prove these things beyond a reasonable doubt for the court to be able to order pro, uh, to order compensation? That would be a gap. So, so, so yes or no. Jillian says no. Jillian, why do you say no? Because um, how, how are you going to prove beyond reasonable doubt that that person was indeed suffering or how, how, how are you going to do that? I mean, I feel like there are, there are, we can definitely think of some situations where we can infer <laughs> pain and suffering, um, you know, things that maybe are not terribly pleasant to discuss, uh, but they are, uh, but I agree with you that that's a, um, that's a serious issue, right? How do you, you know, it's hard enough to prove pain and suffering um, on a balance of the probabilities, right? I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've sat there and had to be the, the, because I'm, I'm, Whenever, whenever I tried a case, I was always the bad guy. Uh, my my co-counsel was always the, the the one that we wanted the jury to love because he was a lot more personable. Um, but uh, I would sit there and I would have to cross-examine, you know, a crying widow or you know a disabled person, and I have to be like, you know, this really wasn't as bad as you as you told us, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's you know i'm sure you can imagine how awkward that exchange really is so um imagine having to do that to a level of beyond a reasonable doubt right what what you would have to put those poor people through um to to prove that that standard so um Okay, 
so I've got, you know, this is, this is more or less everything that I've, I've got ready to go. Um, so what questions do you have uh, about what we've discussed today or anything that we've done so far in the, in the class? So Kezrin, we're, we're at the point where I don't really have anything more for you guys. Um, that happens with these small tutorials. Sometimes the discussion doesn't fill the whole time. Um, and uh, so I, I, what I just asked as you were coming in is, what questions do you have regarding what we've discussed today or anything else that's, that's happened in the class? What, is there anything that you need help with? I don't think he's connected the audio. Jillian, how do you how do you feel about this? I feel really enlightened about it, but I think that I have to read more on chapter two because it is not where I focused on is where um there was a, a case where the the, the, the baby was she, he or she came out disabled and they sued the doctor because I think she she was supposed to take folic acid yes. right and yes. she didn't so the, the the daughter was suing the doctor on behalf of her mother for wrongful board or wrongful um something so that's where I was so I have to read more to yeah. That was the the that was the Tumbi's case, right? Yeah. Yeah. That that came down last last month. Or no, that's that's the um not the Tumbi's case, the McKay case. No. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm losing my mind. One sec. One second, let me. It is Tom's the Mitchell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, all right, that's right, that's right. And McKay is the the case that the defendant relied on in Tombies that did not. Um, I, you know, I understand, and uh, Kesra and I, I understand that you know connectivity issues happen. You don't. I'm I'm completely with you. You know, it, it happens. Um, so we're just, we're wrapping up and I just am checking in to make sure, you know, to see what questions you have about what we've discussed today or anything else that we've discussed in, uh, in the class. So. Once I get some reading done, I would be able to come back to you with that. Especially ah, with regards yes. to cases. Yes, yes, always in your interest to do the reading before you walk into class. That's a, uh, uh, and, and look, I say that when I was an undergraduate, I never did the reading, okay? So you, you are in perfectly fine company, but, you know, profit from my error, <laughs> learn, learn from my mistakes and learn uh, and, and, do your best to, at the very least, uh, skim the readings before before you come into class. Um, if you go on e-learning, uh, and I will actually show you this just while we're here. Um, if you go on e-learning right here, okay, and you can see Here are a few blog posts that um, give you some, some guidance on sort of how to read, right? So I think that's, um, so I think that's helpful uh, on that, on that sense. Um, and those are all, those are written by a friend of mine and he's, it, uh, they're really they're really useful for for undergraduates um, to help them understand like how to manage the reading load because the reading load can be quite heavy at times. 
Okay, so we're gonna wrap this up, um, but uh, I appreciate you guys being engaged and being uh, and participating. Certainly, an eight a.m. tutorial is a challenge, but uh, you guys rose to it, and I really appreciate that. So, I will see you guys tomorrow, and uh, take care, and bye. Thank you, sir. No, thank you. <laughs>